Welcome once again to the Stranger Than Fiction podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Meekin. And uh, tonight on the program, we will be reinvestigating the haunting of John Wesley's home, also known as the Old Epworth Rectory in Lincolnshire, England. Before we get started tonight, I would like to remind you to please subscribe to the podcast, like and share with your friends. If there's anything that uh, you would like to share in the comments, please do. We welcome all your comments. And uh, you can also support the podcast by uh, going to Amazon and uh, picking up a copy of either of my two books, Nightmare in Holmes County, which shares the true details of the first of two uh, consecutive yet unrelated haunted houses that I encountered. Uh, Nightmare in Holmes County shares the details of the first haunting. And my other book, 225th Street, shares the details of the second of two consecutive yet unrelated haunted houses. Both houses uh, were demonic in origin as far as the hauntings were concerned. And uh, the houses, the hauntings themselves were somewhat uh, different in some ways uh, because the causes of the hauntings were different as well. In any case where there is a haunting, there's an open door somewhere. So uh, those books are both available at Amazon.com as paperback, Kindle, if you have a uh, Kindle reader, um, or in audiobook versions if you like to listen to books. Now, you may ask yourself if it's true what he just said, that uh, there's an open door somewhere where there's a haunting, what would be the cause of the haunting of the old Epworth Rectory, which was the home of the Wesley family, uh, meaning Samuel Wesley, who was the father, who was an evangelist and, and, a, and a very strong pastor and preacher, and the sons, John and Charles Wesley, who were great evangelists. Uh, John traveled uh, in the United States uh, centuries ago and all around England, over 250,000 miles on horseback preaching the gospel and casting out demons and uh, having revivals. Uh, his brother Charles wrote uh, many uh, still you know, very well-known hymns that are still celebrated and uh, sang in the churches to this day. So why would their house have an open door for haunting from demonic spirits? And I believe that is a question that we don't have the exact answer to, but I have some suspicions. One, if you look at the lives of the Wesleys, they were uh, often tormented by Calvinists, which were people of a different religious view uh, that followed John Calvin. And uh, they believed in uh, predestination, meaning that, I mean, the Calvinists believed in predestination, meaning that they believed that God ordained for or predestined for some people to be born again and go to heaven. And some people are not predestined for that. And therefore they will never be saved and they will go to hell. And that is all part of God's plan. The Wesleys believed that uh, we all, it's God's will that each one of us is saved and goes to heaven and that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, which is scriptural. So because of these differences in theology, there were multiple attempts on the Wesley's lives made by Calvinists. At one point when John was very young, they burnt down the original house and he almost died. He leapt from, I believe it was a second story window, just before flames engulfed the area where he was standing. He almost died. And uh, at that point, uh, he survived and his mother believed that he would be a great evangelist and God saved him for that purpose, which was true. Uh, but there were multiple attempts on their lives. Uh, there's a well-known hymn written by Charles Wesley uh, titled, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. And the story behind that is that there was a mob of Calvinists seeking to kill Charles Wesley. 
and he was on the run, and he hid in an old, uh, went to an old farmhouse, and a widow uh, took him and hid hid him in her barn. And when the uh, mob of Calvinists showed up, she was very kind to them and let them in and everything. And they realized she's distracting us. They ran to the barn to kill Charles because they believed he was hiding there. Charles had already, out of fear, left the barn and hid and, and continued running. And so he did survive. But at one point, he laid down in very high grass next to a river. And he believed, he's, he was examining his own life because he believed this is it. They're going to find me. They're going to kill me. And in, in that moment and all that distress and preparing to meet his maker, he wrote the song, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. So there was a very uh, much demonic uh, target, if you will, placed on the Wesley family by other alleged Christians who did not like their doctrine of holiness and free will. And so they attempted to kill them multiple times. Now, if, if those kind of things were going on to the Wesley family, then I fully believe that uh, there was also likely all forms of witchcraft done against them as well uh, to, to you know bring demonic attack on the family. In my opinion... I believe the haunting was rooted in something like that, that somebody actually put a hex or a curse on the family, which began the severe haunting in uh, the old Epworth rectory. And it happened at a time when John and Charles were not living there. They had moved on and they were preparing for ministry and doing ministry. But John later returned and very deeply researched the haunting took statements from all his family members and, and deeply researched the haunting. And uh, I had this story shared with me when I was going through Nightmare in Holmes County. A, a minister friend of mine at a, interestingly enough, a Wesleyan church that I was attending, I had shared with the minister that I felt my house was haunted. And one of the things that he did, he, he, he believed me, and he found this story in an old Armenian magazine. It was a direct reprint from uh, John Wesley's own writings of his investigation of the haunting. And he shared that with me. He gave it to me. And I've kept that in my Bible ever since. That's been 20 some years ago now. And I've kept that in my Bible ever since. And this story has fascinated me. But uh, we are going to take a deeper look into this haunting and the details. And I will tell you up front, the details of this haunting rival any Hollywood movie. But the story is completely true. It is not embellished or sensationalized. Yet it is very terrifying. And as you will see, Samuel Wesley stood his ground against the devil and the house was eventually ridded of the haunting and the demon spirits. Again, I would like to encourage you to subscribe, like, and share. And also, if you uh, would like to support the podcast, you can pick up a copy of Nightmare in Holmes County or to 25th Street at Amazon.com. And with that, I present... The Haunting of the Old Epworth Rectory. Now, to those who don't know, John Wesley is one of the most famous evangelists of all time. He is basically the father of, the, uh, of Methodism, which is what the Methodist churches were founded on and have fallen greatly away from, sadly. But he basically preached sanctification with salvation. In other words, live a holy life, get saved and live a holy life. Something that's kind of scoffed at in almost all churches today, sadly. However, that is what he preached. And to start off with, John Wesley was born in 1703 and he died at 89 years old in 1791 
He is said to have ridden his horse 250,000 miles preaching the gospel. He preached and he preached and he preached and he preached repentance. Now, some things that are a little bit different from what (laughs) the methods of modern evangelism versus John Wesley. They said, I think they said John Wesley, basically, if I'm remembering right, that he circled the globe. If you figured up how much he rode his horse from place to place to place, preaching the gospel, he basically circled the globe. It's the equivalent of circling the globe like six times or something like that. And... You know, the, the the way it's preached today is God loves you and Jesus loves you and just believe in him and join our church and, you know, so forth and so on. Very little about repentance. And if there is any repentance mentioned, it really isn't preached for what it really is. However, that's not the way John Wesley did things. John Wesley was quoted as saying, if the gospel is preached in truth... Men should either become converted or become angry. Now, the church today doesn't want to offend anybody, and they don't want anybody to become angry, so they're not going to preach the gospel in truth. But John Wesley did. Now, you know, I never heard much preached overall about casting out demons. I heard it mentioned here and there growing up, but not a great deal. But... You know, I wanted to look at what did John Wesley really believe about that. So I want to look at his own writings. What did John Wesley believe? Did he believe in casting out demons? Because right now, the only guy I think living who's anywhere near to what I found out John Wesley was really doing is Bob Larson. For the most part, that's really going around and addressing this and casting out demons. And Bob Larson is scoffed at so bad It's not even funny. But when I looked at what John Wesley really did, he's the only person that comes to mind that really did that. Now, I know the Kapals believe in casting out demons, and they do it. I believe in it. I do it. And there's pockets of people all over that do it. But I'm saying, where's these big evangelists really doing it? Why aren't the churches doing it? One-third of the gospel that we are to be preaching... One third of it involves casting out demons. So why don't we see it in church? Because guess what? The churches are full of demon possessed people. Why aren't the churches casting out demons and why do they scoff at it many times? So I looked again at what John Wesley believed and taught and wrote himself. What did he believe? And In his sermon, A Caution Against Bigotry, Wesley said this about demon possession. This is a quote. In order to have the clearest view of this, meaning demon possession, we should remember that as God dwells and works in the children of light, so the devil dwells and works in the children of darkness. As the Holy Spirit possesses the souls of good men, So the evil spirit possesses the souls of the wicked. Does that sound like anything you hear in church today? That's what John Wesley believed. That was a quote from John Wesley. Regarding exorcism, the casting out of demons. Did John Wesley believe in that? Let's see. This is a quote from John Wesley. All this is indeed referring to the casting out of demons. He said, all this is indeed the work of God. It is God alone who can cast out Satan, but he is generally pleased to do this by man as an instrument in his hand, who is then said to cast out devils in his name by his power and authority. And he sends whom he will send upon this great work but usually such as man would never have thought of. For his ways are not our ways, neither his thoughts our thoughts. Accordingly, he chooses the weak to confound the mighty, the foolish to confound the wise. For this plain reason, that he may secure the glory to himself, that no flesh may glory in his sight. 
clearly John Wesley believed in casting out demons. There's a great movement in the church today to embrace psychology over spiritual warfare. That's another one of the great problems in the church today. And I'm sorry, the, the father of modern psychology is a man named Carl Jung. It, admittedly, he said he was possessed by spirit guides. I'm sorry, but spirit guides are demons. This idea of embracing modern psychology over spiritual warfare is of the devil. And the very man who came up with <laughs> all the concepts and ideologies of modern psychology was demon-possessed himself. Yet, these colleges are teaching nothing about spiritual warfare and everything about modern psychology. Modern psychology doesn't get anyone delivered. Counseling, Christian counseling doesn't get anyone delivered of demons. You can get counsel till you're blue in the face. It will not cast out demons. I have met people that I that went years to counselors, couldn't get over their issues, couldn't get past being, you know, all kinds of things that they say are uncurable, like uh, bulimia, for instance. Guess what? They went through a deliverance. We addressed this stuff. We cast it out. It reared its ugly head and identified itself, told who it was. And guess what? The one person in particular I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of when I say this spent a lot of money and a lot of time going to counseling, got nowhere. But guess what? Through exorcism and deliverance is a completely different person, completely, completely delivered of all that demonic torment. No longer bulimic. You know, they told her you can't be healed of this. You can't be cured of it. Well, guess what? Cast a demon of bulimia out of them. And yes, they can. But all this counseling and all of this stuff, a lot of it is not does not fit the biblical model at all. And it excuses all kinds of things. And it's not biblical. But the reason I mention that is, you know, I had read a, a quote many years ago where it was in, in one of John Wesley's own sermons. You can find his sermons online, actually. And they're, you know, God forbid, they're spoken and written in the old King James language because that's what they used. But guess what? There was power. There was power in those revivals that John Wesley held. Now, the reason I mention that, though, John Wesley had a friend who was a physician, who was a doctor of those times in an insane asylum. And John Wesley said to this doctor, have you ever considered that some of your patients could be demoniacs, meaning people who are, who are demon possessed. And the doctor replied, I have often considered that they all are kind of flies in the face of modern psychology. When you hear that, doesn't it now through a little bit more research, I found that actually John Wesley did cast out demons Many demon-possessed people were brought to John Wesley, and he cast demons out of them. Now, this is a man who had a very powerful anointing of the Holy Spirit on him, too. And he did not preach mamby-pamby sermons. He didn't worry about pleasing people. As he said, if you preach the gospel and truth, men should either become converted or angry. I think the church could take could do well to take a few pages from John Wesley's book here to, to look at what he really did and start looking at themselves. Maybe I should be doing this, but you don't do the work that John Wesley did and not come under serious demonic attack. If God has you set aside for a great work, which he clearly did for John Wesley, the devil is going to try to snuff you out. Before you ever start, and certainly while you are doing it. The reason I say that, as I start to get into the story of the haunting of John Wesley's home, I would like to point out that the Wesley family came under demonic attack, often through individuals as well. As it turned out, their home had been burnt down because... The people around where they lived and, and his John Wesley's father, Samuel Wesley, was a pastor. And they the people around them in that area where they lived were, for the most part, Calvinists. They were Presbyterian. So they hated, they hated what Samuel Wesley preached. So they burnt down his barns repeatedly. They 
slaughtered his cattle. And then as if that wasn't enough, they lit his house on fire. They did burn down the house. They, they didn't care who they killed. That's demonic individuals. And why were they so upset? Because they were being taught that you had to live a holy life. <laughs> so that was offensive to demon-possessed people, I guess. But as it turned out, at five years old, when that house was burnt, John Wesley almost perished. Satan had him so close to being destroyed. You know why? Because Satan was thinking, this, this idiot is going to get a bunch of people saved. He's going to cast demons out of people. i got to snuff him out now. And hey, I'm going to use these Presbyterians over here. They belong to me. I'm going to use them, and I'll have them attack him. Now, if you're offended by what I just said... I'm sorry, I don't care what denomination. If you're a bunch of people that are trying to murder a preacher because you don't like what he's saying, you're demon-possessed. Spirit of murder was in their hearts. They burnt down the house. Everyone escaped except John Wesley. Samuel Wesley, his father, tried to go back in, and it was the whole house was engulfed in flames. There was nothing they could do, and he knew John was in there. And they gathered in the field as their house burnt, and he started praying. And he, he basically put put his son, John Wesley, in God's hands. He handed him over to God and basically said, your will be done. At that time, a neighbor who was coming to help saw in the upstairs window, John Wesley at the window waving, you know, trying to get help. They ran to the house, the neighbor and Samuel Wesley were able to get up high enough to pull John from the burning house. And they no more than got him out of that house, and the house ended up falling in and was consumed. John Wesley's mother at that point said that God had a call on his life. And clearly he did. Satan tried to snuff his life out, and it did not work. Now, if you're offended by that story... You know what? You've embraced religion instead of Christianity because facts are facts. That is what happened. But that's not the only fact. Charles Wesley was John's brother, a very, very gifted songwriter. Him and John led many, many revivals. Many souls were saved and and, and snatched out of hell because of John and Charles Wesley. Many people on the path to hell were were saved and spared that eternal torment. Charles Wesley wrote over 6,500 hymns that have actually been recorded. Many more than that, even poems that have not been set to music yet. But 6,500 hymns. But possibly his most well-known is a hymn known as Jesus, Lover of My Soul. Very well-known hymn. But the story behind that, which is now there's efforts being made to cover up the true story. But the true story was that Charles Wesley wrote that hymn while he was hiding. He was running for his life. A lynch mob of people of the Calvinist belief system who did not like that John and Charles Wesley were preaching against their idea of predestination were attempting to kill Charles Wesley. He was running for his life. He went to an old farmhouse. The woman at the farmhouse uh, tried to hide him. Uh, She distracted the lynch mob that was coming to kill him. She distracted them. They did not trust her. They, she was doing everything she could to protect Charles Wesley. And they, Charles Wesley was hiding in the house. He sensed that they're going to find me. Uh, While she distracted the men, Charles Wesley then went to the barn. While he was hiding in the barn, the men decided to go search the barn. They went to the barn. As they were, uh, the woman that lived there distracted them again. Charles Wesley escaped again. He was hiding in high grass by a river, believing that his days were over. This was it. This was the time that he passed on, passed over. You know, because he was going to be killed, he believed. That was when he wrote the song. In those moments of desperation, he wrote that song, Jesus Lover of My Soul. Now, again, Satan tried to snuff these men out. Why? Because they were preaching the gospel. They believed in the full gospel, which is what? Healing the sick, casting out demons, and preaching salvation and holy living. Said Satan tried to snuff out Charles Wesley as well. 
There's an, another account where, you know, people in the, in the Wesleyan revivals were healed. Demons were driven out of them. But there was one account where, and I love this story because I love animals, but, you know, as I mentioned earlier, John Wesley rode, rode his horses, you know, uh, you know, it's estimated 250,000 miles preaching in his lifetime, preaching all over souls being saved. Okay. And at one point his horse became ill and he had no way to get anywhere. There was no one he could contact for help. And he laid hands on his horse and prayed for his horse and God healed his horse. And he got up, he went on and kept right on preaching. I believe that's an awesome story. That is an awesome story. And you know what? Imagine people will get up in arms when I say this, but imagine that horse even had a call on its life because you know what? Just like the donkey that, that, that Jesus rode or the, the fish that had the coin in its mouth so they could pay their taxes so the disciples could pay their taxes in the Bible. Guess what? Every God has a plan for everything. I believe even those animals had, um, God had plans for them. And I believe he did for that, even John Wesley's horse, which he used to bring glory to himself. That's an incredible story. But that isn't the only way that Satan tried to snuff out the Wesleys and the Wesleyan revival. When the Wesley boys were very young, Satan visited their home. As the story goes, from the beginning of December in 1716 till the end of January in 1717, the Wesley household was plagued by paranormal activity and demonic attacks. Now, during this time, the Wesley sons were all away from home. The household included Reverend Samuel Wesley, their father, his wife, Mrs. Wesley, and seven daughters, one maid and one manservant. All of those mentioned experienced paranormal activity. Now, I would like to point out that Satan had used people that belonged to him many times over already trying to snuff out this family. And I think he pulled out the big guns, so to speak, in early December of 1716. On December 1st or 2nd, the maid known as Nanny reported to have heard a person groaning in a blood-curdling loud voice. She actually said that it sounded like someone dying. She reported that to the Wesleys, who all scoffed at it and laughed, thought she couldn't possibly be serious. However, she was very serious. Loud knocks and groanings then began being heard in many places throughout the house. The family and the manservant and maid all heard loud knocking accompanied by groans, squeaks, and tinglings, which could not be explained. At first, Reverend Samuel Wesley was completely unvisited by this entity. He had not experienced any of this activity, and he scoffed at it. He did not believe it. The Wesley daughters became very angry that their father didn't believe them. So much so that they became, quote, desirous of its continuance till he was convinced, unquote. The next night they got their wish. Upon retiring, Reverend Samuel Wesley heard nine knocks on the wall just beside his bed. The next night, more knocking followed, and then they encountered, according to Mrs. Wesley, who was present with her husband in the bedroom when this happened. They then heard a noise in the room over their heads that sounded as if several people were walking. Later, strange-looking animals began being seen in the house. Mrs. Wesley and the manservant, known as Robert, both saw on separate occasions what looked like a badger without a head. Robert Brown, the manservant, also said that he saw what appeared to be a white rabbit, which, quote, turned around in front of him several times, unquote. All sorts of strange activity began happening in the Wesley household. Then, John Wesley then later reported that his sister, according to his sister Nancy, one night the Wesley sisters were all sitting up playing cards. They were sitting on the bed when suddenly the bed lifted up off the ground. This bed actually levitated. Nancy jumped down off the bed, but eventually the other girls convinced her to sit down on the bed again. 
When she did this, the bed immediately began lifting up and down several times successively to a considerable height. Nancy then left her seat and refused to sit there anymore. Now this is pretty serious paranormal activity. This is the kind of thing that would, you know, you'd see it in a movie out of Hollywood, sensationalized, and it would, it would scare everyone. But this really happened. Now what I would like to do next, I would like to read John Wesley's own account of this experience of the haunting of the Wesley home. Now bear with me, this is going to be, again, he wrote it in the way they spoke at that time, somewhat like the King James English, but it's a very interesting story. And it goes like this. When I was very young, I heard several letters read, wrote to my elder brother by my father, giving an account of strange disturbances which were in his house at Epworth in Lincolnshire. When I went down thither in the year 1720, I carefully inquired into the particulars. I spoke to each of the persons who were then in the house and took down what each could testify of his or her own knowledge, the sum of which is this. On December 2nd, 1716, while Robert Brown, my father's servant, was sitting with one of the maids a little before 10 at night, in the dining room, which opened into the garden, they both heard one knocking at the door. Robert rose and opened it, but could see nobody. Quickly it knocked again and groaned. It's Mr. Turpine, said Robert. He has the stone and uses to groan so. He opened the door again twice or thrice, the knocking being twice or thrice repeated, but still seeing nothing. And being a little startled, they rose and went up to bed. When Robert came to the top of the garret stairs, he saw a hand mill, which was at a little distance, whirled about very swiftly. When he related this, he said, Not vexed me, but that it was empty. I thought, if it had been full of malt, he might have ground his heart out for me. When he was in bed, he heard, as it were, the gobbling of a turkey cock, close to the bedside, and soon after the sound of one stumbling over his shoes and boots. But there were none there. He had left them below. The next day he and the maid related these things to the other maid, who laughed heartily and said, What a couple of fools you are. I defy anything to fright me. After churning in the evening, she put the butter in the tray and had no sooner carried it into the dairy, then she heard a knocking on the shelf where several puncheons of milk stood, first above the shelf, then below. She took the candle and searched, both above and below, but being able to find nothing, threw down the butter tray and all, and ran away for life. The next evening, between five and six o'clock, my sister Molly, then about twenty years of age, sitting in the dining room, reading, heard as if it were the door that led into the hall open and a person walking in that seemed to have on a silk nightgown rustling and trailing along. It seemed to walk around her, then to the door, then round again, but she could see nothing. She thought, it signifies nothing to run away, for whatever it is, it can run faster than me. So she rose, put her book under her arm, and walked slowly away. After supper, she was sitting with my sister, Suki, about a year older than her, in one of the chambers, and telling her what had happened. She quite made light of it, telling her, I wonder why you are so easily frightened. I would fain see what would fright me. Presently, a knocking began under the table. She took the candle and looked, but could find nothing. Then the iron casement began to clatter, and the lid of a warming pan. Then the latch at the door moved up and down without ceasing. She started up, leaped into the bed without undressing, and pulled the bedclothes over her head, and never ventured to look up till the next morning. A night or two after, my sister Hetty, a year younger than my sister Molly, was waiting as usual between nine and ten to take away my father's candle, when she heard one coming down the garret stairs, walking slowly by her, then going down the best stairs, then up the back stairs, and up the garret stairs. And at every step it seemed the house shook from top to bottom. 
Just then my father knocked. She went in, took his candle, and got to bed as fast as possible. In the morning she told this to my elder sister, who told her, You know I believe none of these things. Pray let me take away the candle tonight, and I will find out the trick. She accordingly took my sister Hetty's place, and had no sooner taken away the candle than she heard a noise below. She hastened downstairs to the hall where the noise was. But it was then in the kitchen. She ran into the kitchen where it was drumming in the inside of the screen. When she went around, it was drumming on the outside, and so always on the opposite side to her. Then she heard a knocking at the back kitchen door. She ran to it, unlocked it softly, and when the knocking was repeated, suddenly opened it, but nothing was to be seen. As soon as she had shut it, the knocking began again. She opened it again, but could see nothing. When she went to shut the door, it was violently thrust against her. She let it fly open, but nothing appeared. She went again to shut it, and it was again thrust against her. But she set her knee and her shoulder to the door, forced it to, and turned the key. Then the knocking began again. But she let it go on and went up to bed. However, from that time, she was thoroughly convinced that there was no imposter in the affair. The next morning, my sister telling my mother what had happened, she said, If I hear anything myself, I shall know how to judge. Soon after, she begged her to come into the nursery. She did and heard in the corner of the room, as it were, the violent rocking of a cradle. But no cradle had been there for some years. She was convinced it was preternatural and earnestly prayed it might not disturb her in her own chamber at the hours of retirement, and it never did. She now thought it was proper to tell my father, but he was extremely angry and said, Suki, I am ashamed of you. These boys and girls fright one another, but you are a woman of sense and should know better. Let me hear of it no more. At six in the evening he had family prayers as usual. When he began the prayers for the king, a knocking began all round the room, and a thundering knock attended the Amen. The same was heard from this time every morning and evening while the prayer for the king was repeated. John Wesley then continues, Being informed that Mr. Hole, the vicar of Haxley, an eminently pious and sensible man, could give me some further information, I walked over to him. He said, Robert Brown came over to me and told me your father desired my company. When I came, he gave me an account of all that had happened, particularly the knocking during family prayer. But that evening, to my great satisfaction, we had no knocking at all. But between nine and ten, a servant came in and said, Old Jeffries is coming. That was the name of one who had died in house. So, obviously, the manservant believed this was a ghost, not a demon spirit, unlike the Wesleys. Continuing, For I hear the signal. This they informed me was heard every night about a quarter before ten. It was toward the top of the house on the outside at the northeast corner, resembling the loud creaking of a saw, or rather that of a windmill when the body of it is turned about in order to shift the sails to the wind. We then heard a knocking over our heads, and Mr. Wesley, catching up a candle, said, Come, sir, now you shall hear for yourself. We went upstairs, he with much hope, and I, to say the truth, with much fear. When we came into the nursery, it was knocking in the nursery, and there it continued to knock, though we came in, particularly at the head of the bed, which was of wood, in which Miss Hetty and two of her younger sisters lay. Mr. Wesley, observing that they were much affected, though asleep, sweating and trembling exceedingly, was very angry, and pulling out a pistol, was going to fire at the place from whence the sound came. But I catched him by the arm and said, Sir, you are convinced this is something preternatural. If so, you cannot hurt it, but you can give it power to hurt you. 
He then went close to the place and said sternly, Thou deaf and dumb devil, why dost thou fright these children that cannot answer for themselves? Come to me in my study, that am a man. Instantly it knocked his knock, the particular knock which he always used at the gate, as if it would shiver the board into pieces. And we heard nothing more that night. Till this time my father had never heard the least disturbances in his study. But the next evening, as he attempted to go into his study, of which none had any key but himself, when he opened the door, it was thrust back with such violence as had like to have thrown him down. However, he thrust the door open and went in. Presently there was knocking first on one side, then on the other, and after a time in the next room, wherein my sister Nancy was, he went into that room, and the noise continuing, adjured it to speak, but in vain. He then said, These spirits love darkness. Put out the candle, and perhaps it will speak. She did so, and he repeated this adjuration, but still there was only knocking and no particular sound. Upon this he said, Nancy, two Christians are an overmatch for the devil. Go all of you downstairs. It may be, when I am alone, he will have courage to speak. When she was gone, a thought came in, and he said, If thou art the spirit of my son Samuel, I pray, knock three knocks and no more. Now, I'm interjecting right here. His son Samuel was not dead at that time. He was still alive, so I'm believing that he was trying to trick the spirit into identifying itself. Continuing, Immediately all was silence, and there was no more knocking at all that night. I asked my sister Nancy, then about 15 years old, whether she was not afraid when my father used that adjuration. She answered, she was sadly afraid it would speak when she put out the candle, but she was not at all afraid in the daytime when it walked after her as she swept the chambers as it constantly did and seemed to sweep after her. Only she thought he might have done it for her and saved her the trouble. Now what she's saying there is she would be sweeping the floor and this spirit would mimic everything that she was doing with the sweeping. So what she was saying was she would have rather, he, if she's going to do that, why don't you just do all the sweeping for me? They began to make light of some of the disturbances. By this time, all my sisters were so accustomed to these stories that they gave them little disturbance. A gentle tapping at their bed had usually began between 9 and 10 at night. They then commonly said to each other, Jeffrey is coming, it's time to go to sleep. And if they heard a noise in the day and said to my younger sister, Hark, Kezzy, Jeffrey is knocking above, she would run upstairs and pursue it from room to room, saying she desired no better diversion. A few nights later, my father and mother were just gone to bed, and the candle was not taken away, when they heard three blows and a second and a third three, as if it were a large oaken staff struck upon a chest which stood by the bedside. My father immediately arose, put on his nightgown, and hearing great noises below, took the candle and went down. My mother walked by his side. As they went down the broad stairs, they heard as if a vessel full of silver was poured upon my mother's breast and ran jingling down to her feet. Quickly after, there was a sound as if a large iron ball was thrown among many bottles under the stairs, but nothing was hurt. Soon after, our large mastiff dog came and ran to shelter himself between them. While the disturbances continued, he used to bark and leap and snap on one side and the other, and that frequently before any person in the room heard any noise at all. But after two or three days, he used to tremble and creep away before the noise began. And by this, the family knew it was at hand, nor did this observation ever fail. A little before my father and mother came into the hall, it seemed as if a very large coal was violently thrown upon the floor and dashed all in pieces, but nothing was seen. My father then cried out, Suki, do you not hear? All the pewter is thrown about the kitchen. But when they looked, all their pewter stood in its place. There then was a loud knocking at the back door. My father opened it, but saw nothing. It was then at the fore door. He opened it, but it was still lost labor. 
After opening first the one, then the other several times, he turned and went up to bed, but the noises were so violent all over the house that he could not sleep till four in the morning. Several gentlemen and clergymen now earnestly advised my father to quit the house, but he constantly answered, No, let the devil flee from me. I will never flee from the devil. But he wrote my eldest brother at London to come down. He was preparing to do so when another letter came informing him that the disturbances were over after they had continued the latter part of the time day and night from the 2nd of December to the end of January. And that concludes John Wesley's own account of the haunting of his parents' home. Now a couple of things that stand out to me. In a previous broadcast, I discussed characteristics of a spiritual warrior. And I have to say, Reverend Samuel Wesley certainly had those characteristics. You know, when he says, let the devil flee from me, I will not flee from the devil. I will never flee from the devil. That's how a spiritual warrior believes and talks. When he told his daughter that two Christians are a mismatch for any devil... That is the attitude of a real spiritual warrior. So those are the accounts, according to John Wesley himself. And I found it interesting that he went back and conducted these interviews very similar to the way I conducted interviews at 225th Street. And that is the story I share in 225th Street. Not only my own personal accounts of three months of living in a house possessed by demon spirits, But also, I went back and I tracked down all the former occupants. Everyone that I could find, I tracked down and I interviewed them. And they gave me their stories. And although they had never shared their stories with the other owners of the house, their stories all matched. The dots all connected. And the house was indeed haunted. But in 225th Street, I not only share that story, which I do believe is fascinating... But I also share practical instructions according to scripture on how any born again Christian can fight back against the forces of darkness and can take authority in the name of Jesus Christ over unclean spirits. And you notice the difference between the story I shared tonight and the story I shared last week. You know, this haunting ended. Reverend Samuel Wesley didn't back down. And he kept fighting till the demons left his home. But the story last week ended in a death of Annalise McKell, also known as Emily Rose, in the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose. What I did not share on the broadcast last week was that not only was Annalise's life snuffed out by these demons and the pathetic attempt at exorcism by these Catholic priests... But also, as late as 2007, Annalise's mother reported that the house in which Annalise lived and was demon-possessed was still haunted. The demons still do things in that environment to show that they are still there. That's not a victorious story of exorcism in any way. However, I do believe the story I shared tonight of the haunting of John Wesley's home is a victorious story because the haunting was stopped. Samuel Wesley did not back down. He took authority. And the other thing is, through the ministry of John and Charles Wesley, many, many, many souls were saved. Many souls were saved from hell and have entered into heaven over the years. Many people were delivered of demonic possession because of the ministry of John and Charles Wesley. So thank you for tuning into the podcast. If you would like to check out the other episodes that were referenced uh, regarding the exorcism of Emily Rose, those are also in the archives on YouTube and on Rumble uh, for the truth of the exorcism of Annalise McKell and uh, Emily Rose, as she was named in the movie. Those are in the archives if you would like to listen to them. There's a lot of other episodes in the archives you may find interesting as well. Uh, But again, thank you for tuning in. If you would like to support the podcast, uh, please subscribe, like, and share with your friends. 
and you can also uh, go to Amazon and pick up a copy of 225th Street or Nightmare in Holmes County in uh, audiobook, paperback, or Kindle version. That also supports the program. I am uh, currently working on a forthcoming book uh, titled uh, Shadows and Light Volume 1 which will also document uh, multiple cases of uh, possession and haunted houses and uh, families that I was able to uh, reach out to and help that went through those experiences and uh, one particular case that the original haunting I was not involved in uh, but it's a very fascinating story and the evidence that will be shared in the book is mind-boggling the photographic evidence of the haunting and none of it can be disproven in any way because there's not only photographs there's also photo negatives because this happened back in the 1990s when film was used more than digital cameras so that book will be uh, forthcoming as well again thank you for tuning in and until next time good night and god bless